Amen. Well, welcome everybody and that you're here and um, joining us online. And we're just excited about what the Lord's doing. I, I just keep, uh, you know, feeling the, the swelling of the Holy Ghost. Amen. As we just get ready to, when we pray about our city, as we, we talk about what God wants to do, I just feel the swelling of, of, of the Lord. Amen. And, and how many know God just kind of like a big wave, there's a couple swells that come before the waves. And so I feel like that's what, amen, we're experiencing. And so, um, you know, I just want to encourage you that you need to really be led by the Spirit in these days, don't you? Can't be led by your emotions, can't be led by fear, can't be led by news, you can't be led by government. You've got to be led by the Spirit. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I feel like we just in this hour are going to be people that really hear God like never before. Jesus said, my sheep know me, they hear my voice. Amen. And we need to be, if we're sheep in the midst of wolves, how many know you've got to be able to hear God in the midst of where you're at? And so I believe that God has um, anointed us to hear, anointed us for battle. He's anointed us to, to listen. And so one of the things that Jesus said is that he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. He was preaching to multitudes, but they couldn't hear what he was saying. He said, you've got to have an ear to hear what I'm saying. And how many know you develop that by in the Word, when you're in the Word of God? You develop a listening ear to God. Come on, somebody. Amen. Not by listening to the, the biggest prophet in the land, but listening to the Word of God. Amen. Following the instruction of the Lord and being led by the Spirit. And so, amen. Well, in Proverbs chapter 22, um, again, I'm just you know, I thought, Lord, should we go on this? And we're going to do it. And uh, in Proverbs chapter 22, very familiar passage of Scripture. And then in Ephesians, the Bible says that we are to train up a child, in verse 6, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, or even when he is old, he will not depart from it, or the training, or what you, or the way that you brought him, the way that you developed them. And then Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up, bring them up, raise them up, develop them, nurture them in the fear and admonition of the Lord, or the nurturing of the Lord. That is the principles of God, the ways of God, the, the, the lessons from the Lord, and, the, and all the things that we learn from the Word of God. How many believe that we need to raise our kids according to God's way? And aren't you glad that you don't need to do a bunch of videos? and a bunch of instructions and classes right here it's in the word of God amen how to raise our kids how to discipline our kids and you know we can't do it by culture we can't do it by uh you know what you what your the way your mama did it necessarily we've got to do it according to the word of God amen Amen. And so one of the things we talked about last week, just want to continue on it. We're going to continue a series on family and stuff, but that is really raising our kids for independence. You know, getting them ready to go, getting them ready to, to live this life and um, be adults. And uh, how many know that's, you know, that, that, that just really should be the heart of every parent, right? Getting my kids to be adults, getting my kids ready to, to go, getting them ready to fly, as we talked about last week. But the goal isn't to perfect children. The goal is to really to train them or equip them in of life, the things of life, by the Word of God. So it's not to perfect your children. It, it's that you'll equip them for life by the Word of God. And I believe that when the Bible says that we're to raise them in the fear of God, that's not the terror of God or the, come on, the intimidation or manipulate, that, that means that is a God-fearing or God-honoring and God-dependent. So we want our kids to be God-honoring and God-dependent. How many can say amen? You want your kids to be God-dependent. That's our heart for our kids. It's not that they'll just listen to everything we say until they're 25, and the, but we want them to honor God. We want them to love God. We want our kids to have a, an experience with the Lord at a young age, like Samuel. We want them to hear God, know God, to, to, to have scriptures inside of them at a young age. That's why we put a lot of emphasis on children's ministry, because it's so important that we do it at a young age. Do you, do you believe that? And uh, I believe that raising you know, a children for adulthood is what we call independence. And independence is, there's a couple of words, but the w main word that means independence is freedom. How, how many agree with that? And all the parents start to get nervous when we say that, and kids are like rejoicing. Yes, my freedom. Amen. But no, that's not what it means. It, it simply means uh, self-supporting and self-governing. And how many know in freedom there is responsibility? How many believe that our government needs to be responsible? How many, we're a free nation, but how many believe we need to be responsible? We need to be accountable. How many believe that there's standards in freedom? Amen. There's duty in freedom, and we've got to do our duty, don't we? And as parents, we have a responsibility. As children, you have responsibility. 
Come on, you have standards, you have duty, and freedom is not rebellion, it's not division, it's not reckless behavior. Freedom really is being able to live by God's way, in God's order, by God's commands. Amen. People think that the Bible is a bunch of rules and Christianity is a bunch of uh, religion that is bound by rules. But how many know Christianity is the freest, uh, really, lifestyle that you can actually have in this earth? Following God is the freest you could ever be in your life. Many people think that I, I'm, I'm finally I'm free. I don't go to church. I don't have to believe in God. I don't have to listen to anybody's standards. How many know that actually leads to bondage? That actually leads to oppression. It actually leads to, you know, whether you're going to be oppressed or you're going to oppress other people, it's not freedom. Well, it's not 4th of July. I don't have to talk on, on that tile level. But, but, so we talked about some common struggles with independence and raising our kids to, to really um, live in adulthood, and that is control, codependence, and conduct. And so I just want to touch on those before we go into the other things. And that is we talked about a few things in control. You know, there's a God-given authority that parents possess and that God is from the Lord. There's a healthy level of control um, that God has given us. Authority is what it, it really what it is that's necessary to raise children. And I believe that one of the things that we're it's important to understand about authority and control when we talk about those things is that we are bending their will, not breaking their will. We are shaping their will, not crushing their spirit. Okay. How many know there's a difference? You, you, you know, there's a difference between trying to make your kids behave versus teaching them to behave. And some people, it's exhausting trying to make your kids behave. Come on, but it can be rewarding to teach them to behave. And that's what the Bible teaches us. There's a reward there. there you know, and, and so I believe that God's not going to put you in a situation where it's, it's just you know, out of your control. God's going to give you the tools to have order and authority in your home. I believe every child needs authority. I believe every person needs authority. How many work for a boss that doesn't like authority or somebody that in your life that they just are reckless because they don't want to have authority in their life? They hate authority. You know, that was a big thing in the 60s. Everything was anti-establishment. Well, how I many know it didn't work out too well? There's some things we haven't got back as a nation that we gave away in the name of, amen, this independence. But, but anyways, when a child tries to take their independence by force or a parent doesn't really teach independence, there's a battle. We call it turf wars and there's battle. And how many know in those kind of battles, there's usually casualties. And we don't want to see those for your family. But really, one of the things that I asked last week is you're either a parent with authority or you're an authoritarian parent. There's a difference. You, you've got to be a person with authority. Because how many know that Jesus even taught us how to be under authority and to move with authority. Amen. And so in leadership, in church leadership especially, Paul and Peter and teach us very, very specifically how to be people with authority, not an authoritarian person. Is that right? The Bible says that's the way the Gentiles behave, but not you. And so we know that. We see that. So there's control in order or there's control by dominance. So there's, con there's a way to have control that brings order, but there's a, a, a also a control that brings dominance and oppression. And that's not healthy and it's not good. And parenting out of dominance produces in insecurity, fear, and it really anger. And it, and it produces it in both the child and the parent. If you're a parent that, that really is kind of trying to be dominating all the time, it produces insecurity in your children. It produces fear in them and then eventually anger. And then it also produces those things in you. Some pe parents aren't really uh, parenting out of the Word of God or faith. They're parenting out of fear. They're just afraid. They're afraid their kids are going to grow up and do this. And they're afraid of this and they're afraid of that. How many know just because you protect your kids from the world doesn't mean they're going to be functional in the world? You can try to protect your kids all you want, and I think you should, to a degree. I think you should. You should try to protect the internet, protect their eyes, protect their ears. Come on. Protect their hearts. You guard, guard your home. But, but I also believe that you get to a place where you're not going to be there forever. You're not going to be around forever. You know what I mean? You're just not going to do that. And you've got to trust God, and you've got to trust them to make the right choices. Amen. That what you train them in, they're going to not depart from it. And so that's what parenting is all about. And I believe, as Proverbs says, it's possible to hang on too tightly and lose everything. It's possible to smother your children. And how many know there's a TV show that's called Smothered? It's about mothers who smother. <laughs> and it, it's possible to hang on too tightly and lose everything. And if you're parenting out of fear and insecurity, you could just lose your kids. You could lose your relationship with your kids. And somebody said, Amen. Is that right? 
So I believe there's two extremes, and, and, you know, and we don't want to go there, but there's two extremes I see in parenting. There's two extremes, and one is provoking your kids to anger, as the Bible teaches, and the other extreme is exalting your kids to entitlement. And how many know that's not healthy? It's not healthy to do that. And so training them to, to make the right choice and not leaving their life to chance. That's what it's about. We don't want to leave our kids' life to chance. Well, they'll learn somehow. How many know media is a, to a, a horrible and a terrible teacher? Amen? Right now, our culture and without God is a terrible, terrible teacher. Amen? If you expect the youth group or, or uh, you know, somebody else or, or the, the Boy Scouts to raise your kids, you know, that, that's not good. That's not healthy. You're responsible. Amen. I'm not sure about that in a little bit. Okay, we need to move on. So codependence is the second one. It's kind of a struggle that we have. And that is teaching or conditioning your children that you will give them everything and anything they want. You're going to do it all for them. How many know that's not healthy? You know, when they're little, you, they, they have to depend on you. If, you don't, if there's not codependence when they're little, tiny kids, that's neglect. There has to be a codependence. Is that right? But after a while, when they get older and they get on, that codependence turns into independence. They have to, they have to come on. They have to do that for themselves. Because what happens is, is if there's codependence when they're really older and it goes on for a long time, that turns into really a, a, a really uh, like almost possession or smothering. Or it's just not, it's not good, is it? It's negative parenting and it's not healthy. And um, so we, we want to do that. You know, one of the things I thought about is if parents that are making too many choices for their child can lead to making too many excuses for them. If you find yourself making so many choices for your children over and over and over, all their life, all their life, all their life, eventually you're going to find yourself making excuses for their poor behavior. Amen? You make excuses why they, well, they don't, I mean, it's the, they don't, you know, they didn't mean to kill that person and, and steal all that stuff. And, and they're just, you're just making excuses. Amen? And enablement is right around the corner. Anyways, making excuses for your children feels honorable at the time. It feels lovable at the moment, but in time it reveals the damage. There's an erosion that happens in your relationship with your child if you keep making excuses for them. Does anybody... Right? I believe that? And so we want biblical independence is what? Complete dependence on God. That's what we want. That's where we want to go. That they'll depend on the Lord. That they'll get to the place that He is their God. You know, it's interesting. Moses, he, there's a famous song that Moses wrote. And, and one of the songs that Moses wrote when they uh, crossed over uh, in, from the Red Sea, one of the things that he said as he sang, he said, my, father, my Father's God and I will exalt Him. Now, if you're back in the 80s, you remember that song, The Horse and the Rider, right? Okay, we did sing that song. And we used to sing it, My Father is God. But if you read the Scriptures, My Father's God. My, Moses' Father, God. I will exalt my Father's God. But then you read later on, and you read that song, and you follow that song along, he says that he is my God. My Father's God has become my God. How many know that's healthy? That's good. Amen. And so that's what we want. And so, uh, you know, we, we don't want to just, and you know, just let me throw this out. I know I'm stepping out on a limb when I say this, but, and, 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 and just kind of, well, you'll figure it out. But don't parent according only to what your church, your denomination, or your pastors say. I will. Thank you. I'm going to. No, I'm just kidding. I, I was going to say, man, I need to repeat that. Don't parent according only to what your church, your denomination, your pastor say. Why? Because those things need to line up with the Word of God. Amen? And so the youth group isn't here to raise your child, not here to police your child. We're not here to babysit your child. We're here to only encourage what you're doing at home. We're here to strengthen what you're putting into them. Amen. That they can grow. How many know one plants, one waters, God brings the increase. That's part of the children's ministry. That's part of youth ministry. That's part of college ministry. That's part. Of, come on. We, we're just encouraging. Amen. And so I've had people say, well, the church teaches this. And I thought the church believed this. And I, and I said, wait a second. Wait, what, what does the Bible say? Because ultimately we need to say exactly what the Bible says. Amen. Right. And so the conduct, I'm going to skip through this, and the conduct, and we teach our children by the way we conduct ourselves, and so we teach them conduct. I believe parents' conduct should be the MVP. Let me explain that. It should be model the message, verbal instruction, and practical application. The MVP. Amen. Let me just... 
couple of couple things because it's important when I think about um, this and raising our children. I've heard parents say that my child is so unique and different. I believe that we need to celebrate uniqueness and differences in our children. I know God loves your uniqueness. God loves your, your differences. Is that right? We have differences and we can respect each other and appreciate each other's differences. Come on. Everybody that's happily married said, amen. That's how we did it. We respected. We loved each other's differences. And, you know, some people, it just seems like they're just going to the beat of their own drum. I mean, they're kind of just on a different wavelength. You ever meet people? I mean, they're just people. They're just, that's just, they think different. They talk different. But how many know your child is not so unique that they cannot come under common standards of the Bible? Well, they're so different. They're so unique. Listen, they're not so different that they need to eat in, uh, supper in their room while the rest of the family's downstairs. They're not so unique that they need to uh, rebel against authority and, and, and do whatever they want. How many know your child is not that unique and that different that they can't come under common standards and principles of the Bible? Is that okay? I believe that you need to develop uniqueness in your child. I believe, how many know you could have, uh, you could have eight children, almost every one of them are alike. Or you could have four children, every one of them is different. Amen? And you know, some of you, fathers, you were sports uh, nuts and you were, you know, you're crazy. You watch all the sports and everything and, and they're math nerds. I mean, and you, you know, they just love math and science and everything. How many know that's different? That's unique. Amen? But we're not going to reject our children because they're different than us. They're not going to reject our children because they like this and we don't like that. Amen. I talked to a father yesterday and they were all about football and wrestling and, and, and they had two girls. And, and he was like, I thought I was going to have boys. I had two girls. Well, I tried to get them into softball and, and it didn't work out. And he said, instead, I'm going to ballet classes. <laughs> I mean, that's usually how it works out. Amen. But we can appreciate that. But how many know our children still have to know there's, there's a common standard. You know, just because you're so unique and so different, you can still use common courtesy. You can still be polite. You can still be kind. You can still love. You can still give. Come on, somebody. Amen. You still got to pay your taxes. I'm so unique. Yeah, okay. Whatever. It doesn't work. How I many you know those kind of people usually end up with white robes in a camp somewhere in California? A gated community. Amen. So we need to move on. But I believe that if you allow your child to practice isolation, then you'll produce neglect in your child. Amen. So, so be careful of that. It's great. You have your space. You have your space. But we've got to really develop each other and develop our children. Anyways, you know, I, I want to just say this, that kids will never understand the value of family until you include them. You have to include them in family. They've got to be included. Your, your children might be different, and, and they're, oh, well, they're all into video games, but how many know our kid, they've got to be included in the family? They've got to be included in what's going on, and you've got to include yourself in their life as well. That's a whole other word, sermon. But I believe that differences in personalities are common. They're, just, they're common, obviously. Now, the Bible says that, that we all have different gifts. They differ from each other, right? They're, they're all different. But how many know it's for one cause? It's for one purpose, and how many know just because you have a gift of prophecy and I've got a gift of wisdom, as the Bible says, that you just can't do anything you want to and I've got to come under all these rules. We all have to come under standards. And we all have to go by standards. The Bible says let everything be done what? Indecently and in order by, in the church. Is that right? Amen. So, you know, I, I also believe this, that what some parents call sinful nature, they call it expression. But how many know some of it's just flat out sinful nature? Well, they're just expressing themselves. They're just cursing at me, and they're just expressing themselves. I mean, that's sinful nature. You know, there's a difference when your child expresses themselves out of the new nature or out of the old nature. And it's out of the old nature that we need to correct. It's out of the old, we teach them, no, we're not going to act out of the old nature. How many know marriages that act out of the old nature all the time usually don't work out too well? But in a marriage, it's important that we act out in our new nature. Is that correct? Amen? And we'll have a success. Well, it's the same thing with kids. They've got to act out of their new nature, not out of their old nature. I hope this is okay this morning. And so they're really, so keep that in mind. So yeah, there's differences. Your child's unique and different, and they're very special. I get it. But they're not so special that they can't do it some things that are common. Come on, somebody, right? Amen. And, and I, I love when parents say that. Every child is unique. Oh, so, you know, they're just a precious flower. Well, try to explain that to their boss. It doesn't work out too well. Anyways. Amen. Second thing I just want to cover real quick, and that is, you know, one of the things is our, our society, our culture is obsessed 
with not making our kids upset or trying to make our kids happy. How many know what I'm talking about? But it's not just trying to get your kids to be happy. It's trying to keep them happy. How many know there's things in life, for instance, you, you are, as parents, you're the authority in their lives. And it's your job to place rules and standards and principles in their life. And it's also your job to follow through with consequences when they are broken. When those things are broken and violated, you've got to follow through. You've got to be the standard. Amen. You're not always going to make them happy by that. Children are not always going to be happy by that. But we've got a culture that's obsessed with making your children happy all the time. How many know that's just going to make them dissatisfied all the time? It's more and more dissatisfied because it's more emptiness. You're never going to keep them happy. Amen. Amen. And I like what one person said is that deep down our kids want that authority. They want that structure. Why? Because it's a way that we love them. When you introduce structure and guidance to your children and principles, it's a form of loving. The Bible says that a parent who refuses to discipline their child, it proves they hate them. It's a form of hate when you don't, when you don't discipline your children. It's a form of abuse when you don't discipline them. Amen. And so that's what the Bible says. So the temptation to fix all their problems and ease all their anxiety and make their life easier without difficulty, it's real. That struggle's real. Come on, that temptation is, we want to do all that stuff for them. We want to make them really, really happy. But how many know life isn't like that? It's just not always like that. And so I, you know, someone wrote this and I thought this was really good. But when we do that, we actually might make life in the future more, more harder for them. Why? Because letting our children experience small disappointments now helps them to handle big ones later on. And how many know life is full of disappointments? It, it really is. And you've got to teach them to handle it now. So you didn't make the soccer team. So you didn't get an A+. Plus. Okay, we're going to work harder next time. That's fine. But we're not going to get to this place, come on, where, where I've got to make them happy. So I'm going to go in and scold the teacher and make... Come on, come on. It's just not going to happen. Well, that's just the way it is. And so we're not always going to do that. But letting them sense failure and disappointments now on a smaller scale will help them when they're older. And could it be that by protecting our kids from unhappiness as children, we're depriving them of happiness as adults? Amen. Let me just do something a little unusual. Uh, I'm going to actually talk to the kids for a little bit. And I know there's not a whole lot of kids in here. You can repeat it to them. Parents are so good at doing that. This is actually what the pastor said. Anyways, but you know, one of the things is the kids, there's instructions to kids is that really God doesn't want independence that causes division and brokenness in your home. So it's not about the independence that you get and the freedom that you get that causes division between you and your parents, but that causes separation or brokenness in that sense. You know, the Bible told, spoke to Abraham and said, to Abraham and said, you're going to separate yourself from your father's house. There's a time that you've got to go on and you've got to inherit your own land. You've got to, come on, you've got to take your own journey. Is that what he told Abraham? And it wasn't like, hey, re rebel, this guy's old and he doesn't know what he's talking about. Get away from this kook. No, he didn't say that. He just said it's time for you to leave your father's home and journey, make your own journey. Is that right? And so just because uh, kids are separated from their parents doesn't mean that your parents are the enemies. Just because that you're learning independence and you're getting, that doesn't make them the bad guy or the, uh, the ones that are fighting you from your freedom. How many know they're the ones releasing you into your freedom? Is that right? And so, you know, one of the things that are important about kids is don't let this time in your life become uh, a negative. Don't let it be. Why? Because one of the things that we have to understand is that the, the attention of our young people are constantly being challenged, constantly being diverted by culture. Their, their attention, their affection, their heart is constantly being diverted by culture. Come on, somebody. And so there's a battle there. There's a challenge there, isn't there? And so as kids, you have to understand that, that your, challenge, your, your attention, your affections right now are being diverted. And, and even now, I don't ever think I remember a time that there is intentional, intentional attack and battle against the family. Intentional against the kids. Come on, somebody. Ever feel that? Have you felt that? You sense that? I'm not just talking about just being weird. I'm talking about that. That's weird. Like, like nobody likes family anymore. <laughs> you know, you get that feeling like the devil hates family. Do you ever get that feeling? You're like, he really does not like family. <laughs> like, he hates my kids and me. <laughs> and, uh, amen. But so isolation and separation from the family is sometimes not good. You know, and being detached from your family. That's, you know, the, the devil is, the Bible says, is a roaring lion. And, and predators always seek weak prey. 
One of the things, they're not going to try to attack prey in the midst of a herd. I mean, they'll try, but how many know that it takes a bunch of them to do it? But what they're going to do is, one of the times, i got to divert a little bit, and, you know, one time I was uh, spotlighting at night and just looking at deer and everything. It's just what we do in Pennsylvania. I don't even know. And, no. And one time I saw this herd of deer, and I saw them almost like in this group. And then on the other side I saw a coyote kind of moving this way and that way. And then as they, the group would move and feed, I saw the coyote moving slowing down then he'd move up here go down there and I thought what's he doing I kind of did a little research talked about some people's one of the things they do is they get up wind so they can smell if there's any wounded if there's any sick if there's any blood right come on how many know the devil does the same thing how many know he sticks around your home he sticks around church he sticks around he wants to see where the weaknesses are he wants to see who's straggling that's why children don't straggle far from home at a young age come on because the devil is a roaring lion. Amen. He's a, he's a predator. That's what he does. And he always tries to isolate kids. Well, your parents are too strict. They're this, they're that. He's always working. But how many know we, we, we've got a, a better weapon called the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, that teaches our kids what unity is all about and love all about and what life is all about. Amen. I hope that's okay. And so that's, you know, to the kids. And so the Bible says Jesus even taught that a man shall leave his parents and cleave to his wife. I mean, no, it's biblical to leave your parents. It's biblical to leave home. Amen. But your children should want to leave home and grow up, not run away and hide. So, so create an atmosphere that, where they're going to want to grow up and they're going to want to live life on their own, not run away from you. Amen? Amen. And so uh, as I close, I just want to uh, talk about preparing for independence. One of the things is that... <clears throat> To, especially with kids, if they don't learn how to biblically be independent and live in godly freedom, that they'll learn life's toughest lessons the hardest way. And that usually has a lifelong pain involved, and we don't want that for our children. But we're going to prepare them for independence. How do we do that? Um, again, it's not rebellion, it's not division, it's not reckless behavior, but it's principles. You know, there's spiritual principles that we need to give our kids, and there's practical principles. How many know your kids need to learn how to wash their own clothes? They need to learn how to wash dishes. Our kids are so used to dishwasher, they're like, how do I wash dishes? You know, so whatever. It's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, uh, the one time we told our kids, we're going somewhere, we're going to, a, we had a wedding or an appointment or whatever, and you guys are on your own, you're going to have to get pizza, just call and deliver, you know, for the delivery. And they were like, how do we do that? So it's like, how do I call on a phone and talk to somebody? So, so... We, we, we let them get off the hook and we just kind of got our mobile app and ordered the pizza anyways. All right. And um, that's kind of how we do it, right? But spirit, how many of their spiritual principles your kids need to learn? That they need to learn that God is their provider. That they can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. That in the rock and, between a rock and a hard place, they can call on the Lord. They can depend on the Lord. They can trust in the Lord. When there's pain in their life, when there's disappointments in their life, how many know they need to learn to be a worshiper, a prayer, a prayer warrior? They need to learn to pray and get a hold of God for themselves. They need to learn. But there's also practical applications and practical things they need. And uh, finances are a big one. Cooking, that's a huge one. And, and how, to, how to, you know, cook. You know, that's great if your kids just hit the microwave and that, okay, great. But there's going to be a time in your life where you're going to have to actually go to the store and pay for things and come home and actually prepare them on the stove and then eat them and then clean up after it, right? So it, you just got to turn, you know, teach your kids that. So anyways, and we'll talk about that later. But anyways, <clears throat> so I got to move quickly, but helping your child really make that transition between childhood and adulthood. Paul said, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child and understood as a child, but when I became a man, there was transition in his life, he became a man. That wasn't one day he woke up and I became a man. How many know at 18, we consider people adults, but how many does it make you a man or a woman when you're 18? Yeah. You do have to grow up, and you have to be responsible. You have to learn some things that makes you a man or a woman. Amen. Come on. And so I think as a parent, you've got to understand that there's age-appropriate independence. We're not going to tell a, our you know, eight-year-old, we didn't tell one of our kids at eight years old, okay, here's the keys of the car. When you get home, lock up. That just, who does that, right? All right? We don't do that because it's not age-appropriate, is it? It's not age-appropriate independence you teach them those things and so I just encourage you that you need to keep up with their age when we were in youth ministry one of the things we found out when we we're talking to parents and kids and and working with parents we found out that one other thing I discovered is that we were usually parents are kind of usually a couple years behind their age 
You know, we, they were like 13 and I'm like, they're like, you know, and I'm just like, you're not mommy anymore, you know, and call me daddy. I mean, okay, whatever. It's just weird in public. But anyways, you know, I mean, they're 13 and you're kind of still think they're like 10. They're not. They're, you know, I mean, they're, they're developing and they're, you know, come on, they're changing and you got to keep up with that. Amen. Amen. Come on, the 16, they just don't need you to tuck them in anymore and every night and make their bed in the morning. I mean, that's just creepy, you know, and they're, they're 16. They're just, you know, and you're still treating them like they're... T- so we got to keep up with their age, but that means we don't push them into adulthood or we don't keep them in childhood. So we don't push your, your eight-year-old into things that just eight-year-olds don't need to be thinking about right now or even, even hearing. Come on, somebody. I need to talk to my kids are seven. I need to talk to them about the facts of life. Well, somebody hasn't talked to you about the facts of life because the facts of life don't talk about the facts of life until they're ready to hear the facts of life. My goodness, right? Come on, they're already seeing it, the facts of life, at four years old. Amen, three years old. All right, we need to move on. So I think that it's important that we really keep up with their age. And, um, and, and let me just move on here. So teaching your children to have fun but not be irresponsible. Teach your kids to have fun in life. Don't be so serious all the time. But yet, you, there's a time that you've got to teach them the serious things in life. I mean, you know, they can't be foolish with money. They've got to be serious about it. They've got to know what's going on. They've got to, you know, all those things. And so teach your children to have fun, but not be irresponsible. There's a time to be foolish, but not be a fool over time. That's what Proverbs teaches us. Foolishness as an adult is reckless behavior. The Bible says that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. In other words, it's there. I know parents are like, it's bound and we're getting it out in Jesus' name. Well, okay. What it simply means is it resides. It's just normal. It's, it's there. <laughs> Come on, as a kid, it's just there. How many know foolishness is in their heart? Being silly and everything. But we want to teach our kids that we, there's a time not to be foolish. There's a time that, that if you continue on being foolish all your life, you'll end up being a fool. And we don't want that. And the Bible says that's not wisdom. So instill value and purpose in your kids, but not pride and entitlement. In, instill value and purpose. Understand what value is in life. And how many believe with all your heart that we've got to teach our kids to get ready to go, to be adults and, and to put away childish things and, to, and that they'll be not just functional people in society, but they'll be godly, righteous people in society. That they'll raise up more godly and righteous people. That they'll make godly, righteous decisions. They'll pick godly righteous person to marry that they're going to come on they're going to go to a good church that teaches godliness and righteousness through the word of God how many believe that I'm going to share a couple other things with you as you stand on your feet can you do that just share a couple other things with you amen how many of those know really God's word is just so full of principles you could go on forever but one of the things I just wanted to throw out there today and if you're taking notes you can just listen later but the basic, some of the basics for kids to become independent, we've talked about a few of them. Number one, loving God completely and loving others sincerely. How many know that's so important? Teach your kids to love other people, not make fun of people with disabilities, not make fun of people that don't have you know, the same things that they have. And you know, Working hard and working at what counts. That's important, isn't it? Teach your children to work hard and work at what counts. A lot of people are working hard at their own hobbies, their own foolishness. Right? You can work hard at foolishness, can't you? But also help them prepare and pray for the future. Help your kids prepare for the future. Help them say, you know what? The future is before you. You, You've got your whole life ahead of you, and I want to get you ready for that. So help them pray about it and prepare for it. The importance of sacrifice, serving others, and saving for the future. Teach your children these things when, they, when you can and you feel they're going to understand it. You know, and, and if you feel like I was a parent or a step-parent, I just kind of got into a family. They have already have kids and they're established. How many know you can still put the Word of God in people? It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. You can still you know, instill these things in people. You say, well, my kids are older and they're out of the house and everything. You can still give them God's Word. You can still help them. And you can be a good grandparent that teaches Amen. Godly wisdom to your children, right? 
to their children and your grandchildren. Um, God's plans and purposes, they're so important, aren't they? Independence is about a strong community. Teach them that. You've got to have other people in your life that speak in your life, that mentor you, that you're discipling, that you're loving. Come on, other people. You've got to be part of a church. You've got to be part of a group of people that love God and, and work together. You need that encouragement. Come on, you need that strength. Teach your kids how important church is and being a part of a church and missions and, and giving and all these things. Come on, that's important, isn't it? And raising them for marriage. That's so important, isn't it? You know, when we talk to the young people, it's like, you're 13 years old, but you're preparing for marriage right now. And, and all the girls would be like, ooh, I'm getting married tomorrow. No. And all the guys are like, what? But no, how many know you're preparing them for marriage right now? Right now, you're preparing them for marriage. So do that. And one of the last things I just want to encourage you is to bring them up to honor God and be God-dependent. We've talked about that. But that is this. Give your children to God. Amen. How many believe, as the Bible says, that whatever God speaks, His Word, it's going to come to pass. And whatever God starts, He's going to finish. God is the author and the finisher. Is that right? And so give your children to God. Listen, I want to tell you something. God is going to protect them. God's going to keep them because that's His promise. His promise is not just for you, but the Bible says that His promise is for your children, for your children's children, for their children's children. Come on, somebody. That the mercy and the love of God, the principles of God are from generation to generation. And whatever God starts, the Bible says He's going to watch over. He's going to be careful to watch over that it comes to pass, that it happens. He's going to make sure the seeds that were planted, the water that came there, He's going to bring increase. Come on, somebody. How many believe God that He's, going to, he's got your family? Come on. He's going to help you. He's going to give you wisdom. He's going to give you strength. Father, we just thank you today for the wisdom of God that is for parents. It is the grace of God that comes on parents to help us raise our children, to bring them up in the fear, the God-honoring, the God-dependent fear of the Lord. Lord, we pray today for, that we would move in this grace, we would walk in this grace, that I would experience your enabling, Lord, for me as a parent, Lord. Lord, by myself, I can't love, I can't do these things, but you are my source. And Lord, I look to you. And I thank you today that, Lord, we're not just going to raise good kids, but, Lord, we're gonna, as you look down and you said on your creation, it's very good. Pleasing to you, God. That's what we want, Lord. And so I pray for parents that are struggling for answers today. Let them turn to the Word of the Lord. Let the Word of God just become alive in their heart. Let them find the Scriptures that talk about discipline and order and authority and how to raise their kids. And, and whether they're step-parents or whether they're blended families, it doesn't matter, single parents. God, You have given Your grace to raise our kids and our grandkids for the glory of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you today that we're just not gonna, just going to walk out of this place and say, well, I hope something good happens in my family. We can say, God, I know something good is going to happen in my family. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. What's up, everybody? This is Michael. Thank you for joining us. If you love what you saw, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and then the bell notification so you can be informed on every time we post new content. If the Lord has placed it on your heart to give, please press that Give Now button. This really helps us not only further the reach in our community in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, but then also furthers our reach into the world. Thank you for joining us today. God bless you.